Years ago, a group of the world's top researchers formed a multidisciplinary team comprising of experts in various fields such as archaeology, physics, engineering, and anthropology. And after years of working together in Egypt, they deciphered the enigmatic mechanisms behind these ancient Egyptian technologies and unraveled their practical applications. And one of the explorers that has made the world talk about his findings is Graham Hancock, who revealed an update the Great Pyramid Internal REM Theory that people don't know, and it is fascinating. According to Graham Hancock, there is proof how much people lied about Egyptian history and pyramids, and it is far different than we ever thought. So, the controversy surrounding the construction of the pyramids in ancient Egypt has piqued the interest of historians, archaeologists, and independent researchers worldwide. The convention academic consensus attributes the construction of these architectural marvels to manual labor, combined with simple tools and ingenious engineering. However, a handful of unconventional thinkers propose different theories, hinting at the existence of a highly advanced, yet lost, technology. Among the most distinguished advocates of this viewpoint is Graham Hancock. He has consistently argued that the conventional understanding of history may underestimate the technological and cultural sophistication of ancient societies. Hancock's hypotheses have often brought into focus the concept of lost technology, an idea that is central to his interpretation of the pyramids' construction. His viewpoint on the pyramids suggests that their construction involved a high level of technological prowess, which has been lost over time. He also argues that the precision and complexity inherent in the pyramids design and construction are beyond what could have been achieved with the tools and techniques conventionally believed to be used by the ancient Egyptians. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for example, has been a significant focus of Hancock's analysis. He has discussed the precise alignment of this pyramid with the cardinal directions and its correlation with celestial bodies. The highly advanced knowledge of astronomy and mathematics this implies is a cornerstone of Hancock's argument for lost technology. With that, the sophisticated masonry, including fitting massive stones together with millimeter precision, has often been cited as evidence. The mainstream academic consensus argues for simple tools like copper chisels and stone mallets, but Hancock and like-minded theorists question whether such methods could achieve such precise results. For him, these anomalies point to a more technologically advanced society that used means currently unknown or undervalued by conventional archaeology. Hancock doesn't stop at suggesting the existence of lost technology. He delves into its possible origins as well. While his hypotheses vary, they all suggest that this lost technology was passed down from a much older and more advanced civilization, now lost to history, predating even the oldest known Egyptian dynasties. This lost civilization hypothesis is based on various historical, archaeological, and geological anomalies that Hancock believes mainstream science has either misinterpreted or overlooked. This includes the underwater structures off the coast of Japan, the ancient city of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and the unusual erosion patterns of the Sphinx in Egypt, which Hancock interprets as evidence of a technologically advanced civilization from a time far beyond conventional understanding. On the other hand, one theory that captivates the attention of historians, archaeologists, and enthusiasts is the zigzagging ramp theory. This hypothesis suggests that the massive stone blocks used to build the pyramids were hauled up a zigzagging ramp. The zigzagging ramp theory, as it pertains to the construction of Egyptian pyramids, is a hypothesis suggesting that these remarkable structures were built using a zigzagging or spiraling ramp to move the massive limestone blocks into place. The theory, principally championed by French architect Jean-Pierre Houdin, proposes a significant departure from other theories that suggest the use of straight or external spiral ramps. Houdin argues that the ancient Egyptians built an internal ramp within the pyramid that zigzagged or spiraled upwards, enabling workers to haul the massive stone blocks from the base to the apex of the structure. One of the compelling factors of Houdin's theory is that it addresses the long-standing question of how the pyramid builders were able to place the huge blocks with such precision, while also maintaining the pyramid's overall shape. An internal zigzagging ramp would allow workers to adjust the block's placement with much higher accuracy and ease compared to other methods, providing a plausible answer to this enduring question. A fundamental aspect of Houdin's theory is that the gradient of the ramp would have been maintained at around 7% an angle manageable for workers to pull up the blocks. The zigzagging pattern of the ramp would also allow for turns and changes in direction, which would be crucial for moving the blocks around the corners of the pyramid as it ascended. 
With that, an internal ramp would be sheltered from the harsh external weather conditions, offering better working conditions and allowing construction to proceed uninterrupted by the elements. This design could also protect the ramp and construction process from prying ice, preserving the sanctity and secrecy often associated with such monumental edifices. Houdin's zigzagging ramp theory is supported by certain microgravimetic analysis that suggest the presence of voids inside the Great Pyramid of Giza, which correspond to the presumed layout of the zigzagging ramp. In addition, there's another belief that suggests the Egyptian pyramids and other old structures weren't made by human cleverness, but were built by creatures from other planets. The theories that aliens built the pyramids primarily springs from a broader subset of theories known as ancient astronaut theories. These conjectures propose that intelligent extraterrestrial beings visited Earth in antiquity, significantly influencing the development of human civilization by sharing advanced knowledge or technology. The pyramid theory specifically points to the remarkable sophistication of mathematical precision of the pyramids, particularly the Great Pyramid of Giza, and argues that such a feat was impossible for humans of the time, thus requiring extraterrestrial intervention. Indeed, the pyramids, especially those at Giza, are a testament to remarkable engineering, architectural, and mathematical capabilities. The Great Pyramid, built around 2560 BC for Pharaoh Khufu, stands about 146.7 meters tall and consists of more than 2 million limestone blocks. The complexity lies in its precision. Its alignment to true north is incredibly accurate, and the side's lengths differ by mere inches, an astounding feat for a structure of such scale. Proponents of the alien theory argue that such precision could not have been achieved by the humans of that period, given the assumed lack of sophisticated tools and knowledge about Earth's dimensions. They point to the seeming impossibility of hauling massive limestone blocks, aligning them perfectly and working with such mathematical precision as indicators of an advanced extraterrestrial hand. Furthermore, Pierre Talley, an archaeologist, made an astonishing discovery in a remote area of the Egyptian desert. He found a series of 30 caves hidden in limestone hills, which had been sealed and remained unseen for centuries. These caves were located far away from any ancient or modern city, a few miles inland from the Red Sea. Talley's exploration began in 2011, and he soon determined that these caves had been used as a storage facility for boats around 4,600 years ago, during the Fourth Dynasty of the Old Kingdom. However, the real surprise came during Talley's third excavation season in 2013. He stumbled upon something unexpected, complete rolls of papyrus. Some of these rolls were a few feet long and remarkably well preserved. They were inscribed with hieroglyphics and heretic, the ancient Egyptian cursive script used for everyday communication. Talley realized that these papyrus rolls were the oldest known ones in the world. Surprisingly, the recently discovered papyrus scrolls were written by individuals who took part in the construction of the Great Pyramid, which is the largest and oldest of the three enormous pyramids in Giza, near modern-day Cairo. Among these scrolls was the personal journal of a previously unknown official named Mira. Mira was in charge of a group of around 200 workers who traveled across Egypt, collecting and delivering various types of goods. Mira meticulously recorded his activities in half-day intervals, his journal mentions stopping at Tura, a town along the Nile known for its limestone quarry. There, his team loaded their boats with stone and transported it up the Nile River to Giza. It is worth noting that Tura limestone was used as the outer casing for the pyramids, and Mira's journal provides a unique glimpse into the final stages of the Great Pyramid's construction. What makes the journal even more significant is that Mira mentions reporting to the noble Ang Huff. This individual, previously known as the half-brother of Pharaoh Khufu, was now definitively identified as overseeing some aspects of the Great Pyramid's construction. As Mira's entries cover the last known year of Khufu's reign, they offer an unprecedented insight into the ancient Egyptians' efforts to complete the Great Pyramid. The discovery of these papyri has brought great excitement among experts. Mark Lerner, a renowned researcher who has dedicated four decades to studying the pyramids and the Sphinx, expressed his enthusiasm, stating that this finding is probably the closest he will ever get to experiencing time travel and witnessing the era of the pyramid builders. Zaha Hawass, an esteemed Egyptian archaeologist who previously served as the chief inspector of the pyramid site and the minister of antiquities, went as far as proclaiming it as the most significant discovery in Egypt during the 21st century. Their reactions highlight the immense importance and value of these ancient documents. Talley, 
The archaeologist behind the discovery chooses his words carefully and doesn't want to exaggerate the significance of the find. During one of his excavations near the Red Sea, he emphasizes that it's still early in the century and we shouldn't overstate the importance of this kind of discovery. When asked about his emotions upon finding the collection of papyri, he explains that after working tirelessly for a month, it's difficult to fully comprehend the magnitude of what has been uncovered. For over two decades, Talay has been working diligently in the lesser-known regions of the ancient Egyptian empire, spanning from the Libyan desert to the Sinai Peninsula and the Red Sea. Despite his long-standing efforts, he hadn't received much recognition until recently. Talay finds it both amusing and slightly bothersome that his discoveries are now gaining attention in academic journals and mainstream media. He believes the sudden interest is due to the fact that the papyri he found provides insights into the Pyramid of Khufu, one of the most famous and iconic pyramids in Egypt. Until these recent excavations took place, it wasn't widely recognized that the ancient Egyptians were skilled seafarers. It was commonly believed that they mainly traveled along the Nile River or stayed close to the Mediterranean coast. However, the work conducted by Talay and other researchers over the past 20 years has revealed that the ancient Egyptian empire had grand ambitions beyond their monumental structures in Giza. They were also venturing outwards and exploring distant regions. This newfound knowledge sheds light on the remarkable extent of their empire's influence. Before Talley's discovery, the only known account of the place was from British explorer John Gardner Wilkinson in 1823. Wilkinson mentioned the location in his travel notes, describing it as a small hill with 18 chambers that had been excavated. He suspected that there might be more chambers, but their entrances were no longer visible. Wilkinson and his companions entered the chambers that were least obstructed by sand or eroded rock. They discovered that these chambers were catacombs, meticulously carved and ranging in size from approximately 80 to 24 feet in length and 5 feet in width. The height of the chambers varied between 6 to 8 feet. Wilkinson's observations provide some early insights into the site, laying the groundwork for further exploration and understanding. Wilkinson, associating the area with a monastery, mistakenly believed that the complex of galleries were catacombs. However, Talay recognized that the description of the carefully carved chambers resembled the boat storage galleries he was excavating in An Sukhna. Similar galleries were also found in another ancient port, Mursa Gawasis, where excavations were being carried out by Catherine A. Bard of Boston University and Rodolfo Fatovich of the University of Naples, La Oriental. In addition, Two French pilots who were stationed in the Suez Gulf during the mid-1950s had taken note of the site, but they didn't connect it to the harbour. Talay managed to locate one of the pilots and, combining their notes with Wilkinson's description and modern GPS technology, he determined the exact location. Two years later, Talay and his team began clearing a narrow passage at the entrance of the boat galleries, situated between two large stone blocks that had been used to seal the caves. It was during this excavation that they discovered complete papyrus rolls, including the Journal of Maya. Talay believes that the ancient Egyptians deliberately placed the papyri inside the galleries, some of which were still tied with ropes, likely as they sealed off the site. This finding provides valuable insights into the practices and rituals of the ancient Egyptians as they concluded their activities in the area. Wadi El Jaf is located just 35 miles away from the Sinai Desert, which means that the mountains that served as the entrance to the mining district in Sinai are clearly visible from there. This Egyptian site has not only revealed a treasure trove of papyri, but has also provided numerous significant discoveries. Within the harbour area, Talay and his team uncovered an ancient stone jetty shaped like an L, stretching over 600 feet long. This jetty was built to create a safe haven for boats, they also unearthed approximately 130 anchors, a remarkable increase in the number of known ancient Egyptian anchors. The site contained 30 gallery caves that were meticulously carved into the mountainside. These galleries ranged in length from 50 to over 100 feet, making them three times the number of boat galleries found in Ain Sukhna. Considering that this harbour was constructed around 4,600 years ago, the scale of this endeavour was truly grand. The magnitude of these findings indicates the remarkable ambition and engineering skills of the ancient Egyptians in establishing such a large-scale harbour facility. Surprisingly, the harbour at Wadi al Jaf was utilised for a relatively brief period. The evidence gathered by Talay and his team strongly suggests that the harbour was active during the 4th dynasty, specifically during the reign of Pharaoh Khufu. 
Talley's excavations have made it clear that this port played a crucial role in the construction of the pyramids. The ancient Egyptians required vast quantities of copper, which was the hardest metal available at that time, to cut the stones for the pyramids. The primary source of copper was the mines located in the Sinai, directly across from Wadi al Jaf. It seems that the reason the ancient Egyptians eventually abandoned this harbor in the favor of An Sukhna was primarily due to logistical reasons. An Sukhna was situated only about 75 miles away from the capital of ancient Egypt, making it more conveniently accessible. On the other hand, reaching Wadi al Jaf involved a significantly longer overland journey, despite its closer proximity to the Sinai mining district. Lerner, an American Egyptologist, was immensely impressed by the strong connections he observed between Giza and the distinct harbor of Wadi al Jaf. He was captivated by the unmistakable signs of Pharaoh Khufu's influence and presence in the site. Lerner described the scale, ambition, and advanced nature of the harbor as reminiscent of Khufu's reign. The large galleries carved out of rock, resembling modern Amtrak train garages, and the discovery of massive hammers made from hard black diorite showcase the immense scale of the endeavor. Lerner highlighted the remarkable size and organization of the harbor, along with the meticulous and orderly hieroglyphic writings found on the papyri. These writings resembled ancient Excel spreadsheets, providing a clear insight into the administrative practices of the time. All of these characteristics displayed the clarity, power, and sophistication reminiscent of the pyramids and the early 4th dynasty, particularly associated with Pharaoh Khufu. Lerner's observations reinforced the notion that Wadi al Jaf was intimately linked to Khufu and the monumental achievements of the era. Talley strongly believes that harbors like Wadi al Jaf and An Sukhna primarily functioned as supply centers. The Sinai region had limited food resources. It was the responsibility of individuals like Mira, who held managerial positions, to ensure that food from the fertile lands along the Nile was transported to the thousands of workers in the Sinai mines. Additionally, they were responsible for retrieving copper and turquoise from the Sinai. It is highly probable that these harbors were operational during the spring and summer seasons when the Red Sea was relatively calm. After using the boats for transportation purposes, they would be hauled up the rocky cliffs and stored within the galleries for safekeeping until the following spring. This strategic approach allowed them to effectively manage the logistics of supplying the workers and safeguarding the boats during the less favorable weather conditions. Evidently, the construction of the Great Pyramids at Giza involved various regions of Egypt. Materials were sourced from different locations. Granite was obtained from Aswan in the southern part of the country. Food supplies came from the Nile Delta in the north, near the Mediterranean Sea, and limestone was quarried in Tura, located about 12 miles south of Cairo, along the Nile River. This extensive maritime activity was driven by the monumental scale of the building projects. In a recent essay, Talley emphasizes that the large-scale construction projects necessitated the need for shipbuilding. While most of the boats were intended for navigating the Nile River and transporting materials along its banks, the emergence of Wadi al Jaf during the same time period provides clear evidence of the expansion of this endeavor towards the Red Sea. This development indicates the logical extension of the Egyptian state's project, demonstrating their far-reaching ambitions in utilizing maritime transportation to support their monumental building initiatives. Additionally, one of the most significant breakthroughs in our understanding of how the pyramids were constructed came with the discovery of the builder's settlement, providing invaluable insights into the daily lives of the people who built these monumental structures. The monumental breakthrough occurred in 2018, led by an international team of archaeologists, under the guidance of esteemed Egyptologist Zaha Hawass. The site was located in the southern city of Luxor, a region famous for the Valley of the Kings. The settlement was found near the tombs of the pharaohs, implying a close connection to the construction of these monumental burial sites. Initially, the area appeared to be a simple mound of sand, but as the team began their careful excavation, the full extent of the site began to unfold. Below the unassuming surface, the remnants of a highly organized settlement lay dormant, waiting to reveal their secrets. This discovery was the culmination of years of meticulous fieldwork and study, and it marked the beginning of an entirely new chapter in the study of pyramid construction. The discovered settlement was not just a worker's village, but a well-organized complex, complete with areas designated for sleeping, eating, and tool production. This evidence revealed that the pyramid builders were not slaves, as was once widely believed, but skilled laborers who worked in three-month shifts. They were given beer and bread three times a day, and meat once a week signifying a fairly decent standard of living for the time. The site itself comprised of numerous structures and artifacts, 
all of which painted a vivid picture of a complex, organized living and working space for the pyramid builders. As the archaeologists excavated the area, they found remnants of buildings thought to be sleeping quarters, spaces that appeared to be communal eating areas, and areas where tools were fashioned and repaired. One of the most significant aspects of this discovery was the state of preservation. Unlike many archaeological sites, the pyramid builder's settlement was remarkably well preserved, offering a unique opportunity to examine the site in detail. The arid desert environment had acted like a time capsule, preserving the foundations of buildings, fragments of pottery, pieces of clothing, and tools in an exceptional state. The layout and organization of the settlement provided key insights into the living conditions and daily routines of the workers. Rather than a makeshift encampment, the site resembled a well-organized and planned settlement, suggestive of a structured society and systematic work processes. Moreover, back in 1974, a French scientist named Joseph Daviditz put forward a groundbreaking idea. He suggested that instead of being cut, the blocks used to build the pyramids were actually poured. When we try to understand how the pyramids were constructed, we need to tackle four main challenges. First, we need to figure out how the blocks were taken from quarries and shaped. Then, we have to consider how these blocks were transported to the construction site. Next, we must understand how the blocks were lifted to the higher levels of the pyramid. Lastly, we need to unravel the mystery of how the entire structure was kept square and level. David Ovitz, who was born in 1935, has accomplished a lot in his career. He has a degree in chemical engineering from France and a PhD in chemistry from Germany. He is also a professor of applied archaeology at Barry University and Penn State. In 1998, he was honored with the title of Chevalier de Order National de Mérite by French President Jacques Chirac. In the early 1970s, when David Davidovitz started studying the pyramids, he noticed something strange right away. The limestone used in the pyramid blocks didn't match the limestone found in the quarries where it was believed to have come from. The limestone typically found in Egypt contains mostly calcite along with small amounts of other minerals like quartz, dolomite, gypsum, and iron aluminosilicate. However, the blocks used in the pyramids have a lower calciate content and contain additional minerals such as opal, hydroxyl apatite, and silico aluminate. What's even more peculiar is that the structure of the stone appears amorphous or glass-like with numerous tiny air bubbles that are not normally present in natural limestone. Adding to the mystery, many of the blocks show unusual layers, with large fossil fragments concentrated at the bottom and lighter grains at the top, instead of the expected alternating bands seen in regular limestone. Another intriguing find was a block on the Giza Plateau that seemed to be made of two different types of stone, with one half eroded faster than the other. Based on these findings, Davidovitz reached a surprising conclusion. The pyramid blocks were not made out of natural limestone, but rather a man-made substance called geopolymer. Essentially, it is a type of ancient Egyptian concrete that was used in constructing the pyramids. Davidovitz proposed a different explanation for the construction of the pyramid blocks. He believed that instead of quarrying and moving the blocks to Giza, they were actually created right on site using molds made of wood. According to this theory, the limestone was in a liquid form when it was poured into the molds. This method would explain the remarkable precision of the pyramid's construction because the liquid limestone would naturally level itself and result in very thin gaps between the blocks. This casing technique was particularly well suited for the Giza Plateau because the area had plenty of soft and crumbly limestone that wasn't suitable for large-scale construction using traditional methods. In his laboratory, Davidovitz successfully created a special type of limestone concrete using only four ingredients that were easily accessible to the ancient Egyptians. These ingredients included water, crushed limestone, quicklime, and natron, a mixture of salt and sodium bicarbonate commonly found along the Nile and used in mummification. To validate his findings, Davidovitz conducted blind tests. He sent out samples of his laboratory-made concrete along with pieces of actual pyramid stones to various labs for analysis. Surprisingly, every laboratory reported that the composition of the lab-made concrete and the pyramid stones was identical. This result was seen as conclusive evidence, suggesting that Davidovitz had finally solved the long-standing mystery of how the pyramids were constructed. In 1988, he published his groundbreaking findings in a book titled The Built, The Pyramids. That's it for today. Subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell.